Thank you very much for coming to the second lecture of this mini course. Here is the plan for today. First, I'll explain the theory of Temkin's metrization and the Kondasevich Soberman essential skeleton. Second, I will introduce skeletal curves, which is a key notion in the theory. Third, I will explain where do skeletal curves come from in practice, natural sources of skeletal curves. And the fourth, I will introduce naive counts of skeletal curves. And finally, I will give a proof of the symmetry theorem by skeletal curves as an application of the theory of skeletal curves. We will see other applications of skeletal curves in the next lectures. Okay, so let's start with uh, the first part, Temkin's metrization and the kondasevich soberman essential skeleton. The idea is the following. Bayakovich non-Archimedean analytic spaces have very complicated underlying topological spaces. For example, the analytic P1 is an infinite uh, tree uh, containing infinitely many vertices and infinitely many branches. And the Bayakovich analytic elliptic curve is infinitely many trees attached to a circle. It is impossible to visualize uh, Bayakovich analytic spaces in higher dimensions, but they contain very nice piecewise linear subsets called skeletons. In general, skeletons are not unique. They depend on the choice of formal models. But if we are given a volume form omega on the analytic space, then we can define a unique skeleton, SK of omega, associated to the volume form omega. Thus, for Calabi-Yau variety, where we have a unique volume form up to scaling, we have a canonical skeleton called the essential skeleton. For example, the circle inside this elliptic curve is uh, the essential skeleton of the elliptic curve. Here is the history of essential skeleton. In 2000, Kondasevich and Soberman constructed an essential skeleton inside non-Archimedean analytic calabi space x over c double parenthesis t of maximal degeneration. Here, c double parenthesis t denotes the field of formal Laurent series. Uh, their method is the following. First, they define a weight function psi on divisorial points x div inside x using semi-stable models of x. And then they define the essential skeleton SK of X inside X to be the closure of the minimum locus of Psi. After that, in year 2012, Mustata Niges extended the weight function Psi to the whole analytic space. So it is no longer necessary to take closure for defining the essential skeleton. Then in 2017 and 2018, Brown Mason and Maury Mason Stevenson, they extended the weight function and the essential skeleton to pairs. And in 2014, not really in 
chronological order, Michael Temkin made a vast generalization. He bypasses completely the use of semi-stable models. In this way, he is able to extend the theory of weight function and essential skeleton to any non-Archimedean base field, not necessarily of characteristic zero or discrete valuation. And moreover, his theory works in the relative situation for any uh, analytic space X over another analytic space S. His method is the following. First, he provides the sheaf of Keller differentials on X, omega X, with the maximal seminorm called Keller seminorm, uh, which is the maximal seminorm making the differential D from the sheaf of uh, functions on X to the sheaf of differentials on X a non-expensive map. He calls this maximal seminorm Keller seminorm. Then this gives rise to a seminorm on the canonical bundle Kx by taking top exterior power of the sheaf of uh, Keller differentials. Now, if we have a volume form omega, and we, if we apply this seminorm to omega, we obtain a real valued function. And the Temkin proved that this real valued function is equal up to a constant to the kondasevich soberman mustata nikes weight function in the situations where the weight functions are well defined. And the essential skeleton in Temkin's language is just the maximum locus of this Keller seminorm of this volume form omega. This is uh, roughly his method. And since we will need Temkin's formulation to establish some properties of essential skeletons for uh, some of our proofs. Here, let me give more details of Temkin's construction. So first, let us define seminorm, uh, some seminorm at the level of rings. Definition, given a seminorm the ring B, and a homomorphism of rings, phi from A to B, we equip omega B over A, the module of relative Kähler differentials with the Kähler seminorm by the following formula. For any element X in uh, this module of relative Kähler differentials, we define its Kähler seminorm to be uh, follows. First, we write x as sum of ci dbi, where ci and bi lie uh, in b. ci and bi are elements of b. And we take the maxim, maximum over i of the norm of ci <coughs> times the norm of bi. And then we take inf of this maximum over all possible ways of writing x as sum of ci dbi. So this gives the definition of Keller seminorm at the level of rings. And the Temkin proves that uh, gives a canonical characterization of this uh, Keller seminorm defined by the explicit formula. He proved that this Keller seminorm is the maximal seminorm that makes the differential D from B to the module of relative Keller differentials a non-expansive ahomomorphism.
Now let's consider uh, the global geometric situation. Given F, a morphism of K analytic spaces, where K is any non Archimedean base field, we apply this above definition at the level of rings, we obtain immediately a pre sheaf of Kähler seminorms on Arvinoid domains. Then, via sheafification, we obtain so called Kähler seminorm on this sheaf of uh, relative Kähler differentials. And uh, similarly, we have a canonical characterization, as in the lemma above, Temkin shows that this norm defined from sheafification is simply the maximum uh, semi-norm on this sheaf of relative Kähler differentials, making the map D from the sheaf of functions to the sheaf of differentials a non-expensive map. And now, if we take top exterior power and arbitrary tensor product, we obtain uh, the Kähler seminorm on pluri volume forms. There is a small technical point is that, uh, in fact, we have to consider so called geometric Kähler seminorm after passing to algebraic closure in order to get better properties. Now here is a theorem of uh, Temkin. For any plurivolume form omega, uh, we can take its Kähler seminorm and we obtain a real valued function on X. Temkin's theorem says that this uh, Kähler seminorm of omega is an upper semi-continuous function. The theorem says that this real valued function, seminorm of omega, is an upper semi-continuous function. Now we make the following definition. We define the skeleton of X associated to any plurivolume form omega to be simply the maximum locus of the Kähler seminorm of omega. It's possibly empty if the maximum doesn't exist. And uh, um, we denote this skeleton associated to omega by SK of omega, considered as a subset of X. So this definition of skeleton depends on the choice of some plurivolume form. And now let's introduce the definition of essential skeleton, which is just a union of all uh, such skeletons over all possible volume form. Here it is. Um, definition essential skeleton. Let K be a non Archimedean field of characteristic zero and let X be any smooth K variety. We define the essential skeleton of X denoted as SK of X to be simply the union of skeletons associated to all omega where uh, over all log plurivolume form omega. And by definition, a log plurivolume form is just um, a section of this line bundle, which is some arbitrary tensor product of the logarithmic canonical bundle. And here 
we take any SNC compactification x in y and so y is any SNC compactification of x and d is the complement of x. And one can show that this space of sections is independent of the SNC compactification we choose. So we can just choose any SNC compactification, uh, consider all plurivolume forms as sections of any tensor powers of the logarithmic canonical bundle, take the associated essential, take the associated skeleton, and then take union. And this is by definition the essential skeleton of X. Since we have taken union over all volume forms, it, uh, it's just canonically associated to X. Let's introduce a notation for later use. When a compactification X in Y is fixed, it's usually quite natural to consider the closure of the essential skeleton of X inside the identification of Y. And we denote this closure by SK bar X. Um, sometimes we call it the closed essential skeleton. So that makes sense if we have a compactification fixed. Um, let's give some examples of essential skeletons. First example, we take X to be um, the algebraic torus. In this case, the essential skeleton of X is homeomorphic to Rn. And it lives in the identification of the algebraic torus. One can show that the essential skeleton of X is in fact a birational invariant um, with respect to volume forms, of course. So if U is a log Calabi-Yau variety containing a Zariski open torus Tm, M being the co-character lattice, as in the previous talk, then the essential skeleton of U is just equal to the essential skeleton of the torus and it's homeomorphic to uh, MR, the lattice M tensored with R. So it's just RN. Mm -hmm. So for our local ABL, the essential skeleton is very simple, just Euclidean space. Second example, we take X to be P1 minus some closed points. In this case, the essential skeleton of X is equal to the convex hull of uh, these points. So recall that the analytic P1 is uh, an infinite tree with infinitely many vertices and infinitely many branches. And we take out some closed points from this tree. The closed points, they are points on the boundary of this disk. Then the claim is that the essential skeleton of the punctured P1 is equal to the convex hull of these points. So here we take out four points, four closed points, and then the essential skeleton is the convex hull of these four points, which is this red subtree inside this infinite tree. Example three, we take X to be an elliptic curve with bed reduction, whose analytification is infinitely many trees attached to a circle. In this case, the essential skeleton is just the circle inside and it's 
in the in inside this analytic space. Then we have a two-dimensional add log of this example three, where we take x to be a K3 surface with maximal degeneration. And in this case, the essential skeleton is homeomorphic to S2, two-dimensional sphere, inside the identification of X. The final example we want to give is the following. We take X to be um, M0N, the moduli space of P1 with N marked points. Then we show that the essential skeleton of X is homeomorphic to TROP 0N, the moduli space of rational tropical curves with N legs. So we show this by considering the classical Dolin Manford uh, compactification M0N bar of X consisting of uh, stable n pointed rational curves. And then uh, we show that it gives rise to a minimal compactification and we further deduce that uh, the essential skeleton is just uh, uh, the usual the skeleton associated to the compactification and that skeleton was previously studied in the work of Abramovich, Caporoso and Payne. So that's, uh, for the moment, that's what I want to explain for the theory of Temkin's metrization and the essential skeleton. Now let's turn to the next section. Uh, we will introduce the notion of skeletal curves, which is a key notion in, in the theory. The idea is the following. Let's consider an analytic curve C in a log Calabi-Yau variety, U analytic. We have our log Calabi-Yau variety, U analytic, analytification of our log Calabi-Yau variety, and inside we have this blue essential skeleton. It's a piecewise linear subset embedded in this analytic space, this blue essential skeleton. And we consider some analytic, this red analytic curve C inside our Calabi-Yau. If the dimension of U is greater or equal to two, then by dimensional reason, the curve C never meets the essential skeleton because the points in the essential skeleton are valuations on the generic point of uh, the variety U. And the points in the curve, the curve C is a one dimensional subspace. The points of the curve C, they are at most of dimension one, while the points in the in this uh, essential skeleton is uh, the points in this essential skeleton is um, of top dimension. So this curve C has no chance to meet this essential skeleton just because of dimension reason. But we can let the curve C touch the essential skeleton, SKU, essential skeleton of U, if we allow the curve C to be defined over a big non-Archimedean field extension, K in K, K prime of K. And here is the surprise. And as soon as some K point of the curve C touches the essential skeleton of U, then the whole skeleton of the curve C must lie in the essential skeleton of U. So we observed that in general by dimensional reason, 
there's no chance for a curve C to touch this green uh, essential skeleton. But if we allow the curve C to be defined over a big enough non-Archimedean field extension, then as soon as some K point of C touches the, this essential skeleton SKU, then the whole skeleton of C will lie in the skeleton, the essential skeleton of U. Now let us give the precise statement. We fix some log color BL variety U, the orange U over K, some volume form omega on U, U in Y, here Y, some SNC compactification, and let D be the divisors at infinity. We denote by D essential inside D, the union of essential divisors. By essential divisor, we mean divisors where the volume form omega has a pole. So here in the picture, mm, these dark blue curves denote essential divisors while this light blue, light blue curve is a non-essential divisor. And now we will consider some curve C uh, in Y, this red curve that touches uh, some points of the boundary divisor. So as we said, we must, uh, if we want the curve to touch the skeleton, we must pass to a big enough field base field extension. So let k in k prime be a non-Archimedean field extension. And we choose C, a rational nodal curve over k. We consider F a k prime analytic map from uh, the base change from the base change of C to the base change of Y, such that uh, the pre-image of F, the pre-image by F of the divisor D is equal to the pre-image by F of the essential part. In other words, the curve C meets only essential divisors it, it, at infinity. And furthermore, we ask that the pre-image of the essential divisors is some linear combination of uh, k points, pi in C, such a curve, which mainly lies in, in the interior U. And when it hits the bound, boundary divisor, it hits only the essential part at some uh, k rational points with some multiplicities. Mm, so F is a k prime analytic map between the base changes. And we consider the composition of F with this natural projection map given from the base change. So we have made a base change and we have the natural projection of base change and we consider the composition which we denote by Fy. Now the claim is that if Fy of x lies in the essential skeleton of U for some k point x, then Fy of the essential skeleton of the base change of the punctured curve, C naught is just C minus the marked points. So then Fy of the skeleton of the punctured curve will lie totally in the essential skeleton of U. In other words, the whole, in other words, the whole skeleton of the curve lies 
in this essential skeleton of you. And recall from the example that we uh, mentioned above, the essential skeleton of such a punctured curve is just equal to the convex hull of all the marked points in the analytic space. So this is a precise statement and we call such F uh, skeletal curves. Here is an example of skeletal curve. We take U to be the algebraic torus and we have seen from the examples above that the essential skeleton of the algebraic torus is just uh, Rn, this blue plane, um, essential skeleton homomorphic to Rn. And we take our curve C to be just uh, uh, P1. So it's an infinite tree. And we choose four marked points in P1. One, two, three, four, four marked points in P1. Then uh, the essential skeleton of the punctured curve C0, C minus the four marked points, is just the convex hull of these four marked points, which is this red subtree inside this infinite uh, tree. And now we consider a map from this P1 to the algebraic torus. So as we said, in general, this map, the image of this P1 has no chance to meet this blue essential skeleton just because of dimensional reason. But if we pass to a big enough base field extension, then it might happen. And the theorem says that if some k point of the curve C hits the blue essential skeleton, then the whole skeleton, this red subtree, the whole skeleton of the curve will lie in the essential skeleton of U. The major advantage of skeletal curves is that they have canonical tropicalization. Since the map Fy maps the skeleton of the curve into the essential skeleton of U, we can just restrict this map Fy to the essential, to the skeleton of the curve, and we get some tropical object from some finite tree, some tree, which we denote by gamma, to this, this uh, polyhedral uh, object. And this, uh, this restriction is independent of any choice of uh, retraction map from the identification of U to the essential skeleton of U. So in general, uh, for general curve, this image of the, is the skeleton of the curve will does not lie in the essential skeleton of U. Therefore, to get anything tropical, we must further compose with a retraction from the analytification of U to the essential skeleton of U. But this retraction is not canonical. For example, different minimal compactification U in Y gives different retraction maps. So then for general curve, different retraction maps gives different tropicalizations. But for skeletal curves, uh, the compactification does not matter. We always have a canonical tropicalization. And we call this restriction the spine associated to the skeletal curve. So in the example above, the spine, the associated spine is simply the map from this red subtree to the blue 
to the blue plane with red curve. And this is canonical independent of any choice of retraction. Now let me uh, explain the idea of the proof of the skeletal curve theorem. Let's first recall the statement. We have some non-Archimedean field extension, k prime of k, and a rational curve, nodal rational curve c over k. And we consider a k prime analytic map of the base change of c to the base change of y, such that the curve hits the boundary divide meets only essential boundary divisors at some uh, k points. And we consider the composition of f with the projection map of from the base change. The claim is that if fy of x, if fy sends some k point of the curve to the essential skeleton of u, then fy sends the, the skeleton of the base change of the punctured curve, which is just c minus all the marked points, to the essential skeleton of u. In other words, the whole skeleton of the curve lies in the essential skeleton of u. Mm, here is the idea of the proof. So for the proof, we put the map f above into a family. And we consider the skeleton of the family and also the skeleton, the skeleton of the base. We want to relate various skeletons together. In order to put the map into a family, very naturally we consider a home scheme consisting of all maps from the curve to y analytic, and then we consider the subspace of the home scheme H consisting of all maps F from C to Y analytic of the same curve class and the same same intersection pattern with D as uh, the given the given one. We have uh, the following diagram. So H is uh, some space of maps. Over H we have the universal curve which is just a product since it's just a space of maps. The domain curve doesn't change. So it's just a product C times H. We have uh, two projections PC to C, PH to H. Then we have uh, the universal map from the universal curve to Y which we denote by E and we consider also the map phi from the universal curve to c times y, whose first factor is projection to c, and the second factor is given by the universal map. By the deformation theory of curves, we can show that the map phi is a tal over some dense Zariski open subset of the target. It's generically a tal. Furthermore, using deformation theory of curves by computing the tangent spaces of H, we show that the volume from omega on U in Y, the volume from omega on U gives rise to a volume from omega H um, on H. So it induces a natural volume from omega H. Then we do an explicit computation. One can see that the pullback of omega, omega is here, the pullback of omega by E and the pullback of omega h, omega h is on h, 
by the projection map pH, they agree on pH horizontal tangent spaces of the universal curve. So they may not completely agree, but they agree on horizontal tangent spaces. This implies that for any one form alpha on the punctured curve C, if we pull back alpha by the projection mag PC and we wedge uh, the pullback of omega by E, this is equal to uh, the pullback of alpha by PC and a wedge the pullback of omega H by PH. It's just because they agree on the horizontal tangent space, the two forms. So if uh, we wedge anything vertical, uh, we get equality. We denote this by equality star. And the second, um, for any k rational point, k point x uh, in C, which is not a, the, a marked point pi, we consider the evaluation map at x, evx, which is a map from this space of maps h to u, just evaluating at x to u analytified. Then since such an x gives a horizontal section, gives a horizontal section of this uh, projection pH, <coughs> Uh, we see from, since these two forms agree on, on the horizontal tangent spaces, and uh, if we pull back using the horizontal section, we see immediately that uh, the pullback of omega by EVX is equal to, is just equal to the volume from omega H. And that implies that the pre-image of the essential skeleton of U by EVX is equal to the is just equal to the essential skeleton to the skeleton of H associated to the volume from omega H. This is because again by the deformation theory of curves, we can one can see that the evaluation map EVX is generically etal, and that implies that pullback of skeleton is equal to skeleton of pullback. So here, pre-image of skeleton by the etalness of EVX, pre-image of skeleton is just a skeleton, uh, skeleton of pullback. So this omega H is pullback here. And we denote this equality by double star. <coughs> Now let's pick one fiber of our family. So we choose any point F in H. H is the space of maps. We choose any point F. We denote by CF the fiber of the universal curve at F. So recall that the universal curve is just a product. So the fiber at F is just some base change of C. And F H is the space of maps. F is a point in the space of maps. So F gives a map from the fiber C F to Y analytic, which is just the restriction of the universal map E from the universal curve to from the universal curve to Y analytic. Uh, there should be no C here. And it's natural to denote this map F because it's really given by F. Assume, now assume that Fx lies in the essential skeleton of U for some K rational point X. C 
since fx is just evaluation of f at x, so this equality double star implies that f lies in the, the skeleton associated to the volume from omega h because we assume fx lies in the skeleton of u and fx is just evaluation of x at f. So by this equality, uh, we know that evaluation evx of f lies here means that evx of f lies in skeleton of u means that f lies in the pre-image of the skeleton of u uh, by evx which means that f lies in the skeleton associated to omega h. So we get a very nice characterization of f now just from our uh, hypothesis. And recall our goal is to show that f of the skeleton of the punctured C not the punctured fiber C not F lies in the essential skeleton of U. So in order to show that, let's compute uh, let's compute this preimage preimage by phi of the product of the skeleton of C not times the the skeleton of U. When we want to show this. We compute this product. We, we will use the map file. And by definition, the skeleton, essential skeleton of C0 is just a union of skeletons associated to all possible log volume forms on C0. Here, taking union over log volume forms or pluri, log pluri forms, they are the same. So first equality is by definition of essential skeleton. Next, using Temkin's theory of metrization, um, Temkin's metrization theory, one can show that the skeleton of product is equal to product of skeleton. So here we have product of skeleton and it's equal to skeleton of product with respect to the wedge of the volume forms. And the next, recall that the phi is generically etal by deformation theory. This implies that pullback of skeleton is equal to skeleton of pullback. So here we have pre-image of skeleton uh, by some etal map, and this is equal to skeleton of the pullback of the form by this map. Now recall, by definition, phi has two factors. First factor is the projection to C. Second factor is the universal map E. So by definition of phi, um, by definition of phi, this is just equal to the skeleton of pullback of alpha by PC, which pullback of omega uh, by E. And now we apply, now we apply our explicit computation, this equality of uh, forms on horizontal vector spaces. We apl apply our explicit computation, we deduce that this is equal to skeleton of this wedge product. So we replace this wedge, this pullback of omega by E by this pullback of omega H by, by PH. And then to summarize this, this by definition again is just uh, the essential skeleton of C0 of the punctured curve times the essential skeleton of omega h. And we observe that by Temkin's metrization theory, a point Z lies in the essential, in the skeleton of a product x times y if and only if 
z、uh, projects to a point y in the skeleton of y of big y, and z li- lies in the skeleton of the fiber x y. So a point lies in skeletal product if and only if it projects to skeleton of the base, and moreover it lies in skeleton of the fiber. Therefore, since F lies in the skeleton associated to the form omega h, so we think h as the base here. Therefore, for any x in the skeleton of the fiber, in the skeleton of the fiber,、uh, the punctured curve at F, this computation, the equality above between this. This one and this one shows that x just lives in the pre-image of the product of skeleton. Because by what we just said,、uh, f already lives. So we look at this line. F already lives、uh, in the skeleton of the base. Now. If we choose any point in the skeleton of the fiber, then this point actually lies in the skeleton of of this、uh, total space, and that is just equal to the pre-image of this product of skeleton. So this shows that x lies in the pre-image by phi of this product of skeleton, and we deduce that. Just to recall the definition of phi. We deduce that f of the skeleton of the punctured curve at f lies in the essential skeleton of U. In other words, the the skeleton of the curve maps to the essential skeleton to the essential skeleton of U. So proof complete. Remark. Um, by adding extra k points to our curve C as marked points, the above argument has a stronger and perhaps more surprising result. We can show that the convex hull of all k rational points、um, inside the fiber C F maps. To the closed skeleton, S K U, the closed essential skeleton, which is just the closure of the essential skeleton in this fixed compactification, Y analytic. So not only the skeleton of the curve maps to the skeleton of the target local area, but the convex hull of all K points will. Lie there.、Um, so this, that is all I want to say for the proof of the skeletal curve theorem.、Uh, if you did not、uh, follow every、uh, line of the proof, no worries. And now we will move to the next topic. So the question is. The skeletal curves seem so nice. They have、uh, um, they have canonical tropicalization, and we will be using them for many purposes. So the natural question is, where do they come from in practice? And、uh, in the next section, we will talk about、uh, natural sources of skeletal curves. Let's first make. Five minutes break before moving on to the next section. So the skeletal curves they seem so nice, but、uh, where do they come from in practice? And that's what I will explain. Uh, in the next part of、uh, this lecture, 
Uh, so let's explain where do skeletal curves come from. Recall from the Frobenius structure conjecture that we are interested in counting rational curves in Y with prescribed intersections with the boundary D. So we have Y, some SNC compactification of our log color BL U, and we are interested in counting this kind of uh, red curves whose intersection with numbers, whose intersection numbers with the boundary divisors are fixed. Or uh, if we can also phrase it in terms of the interior, in other words, we are interested in punctured rational curves in U with prescribed asymptotics at the punctures. Anyway, U is uh, what we ultimately care about. So let's fix some notations uh, for convenience. Um, we have a tuple, bold P, consisting of uh, Pj, where Pj are integer points in the skeleton. So in my last lecture, I give an explicit formula for this SKUZ, which is just zero disjoint union with the positive integer multiples of uh, essential divisorial valuation. And now, uh, in this lecture, I explained uh, the theory of essential skeleton, and uh, they are just integer points inside the, the essential skeleton. So we fix this tuple in order to prescribe intersections of our red curve with the boundary D. Um, some PJ can be zero, and we call such J internal marked points. For example, uh, we can have an internal marked point uh, P4, uh, internal because they maps to the interior. And uh, for non-zero PJ, we call such J boundary because these marked points are supposed to go to the boundary and we write uh, PJ as uh, in this explicit form, multiples of some divisorial valuation, mj times nu j, and the divisorial valuation is just the sum divisor at infinity. So we can always assume that nu j is given by some component of our boundary D after making some blow up. Now let's consider the moduli space, the moduli stack M U bold P beta consisting of n pointed rational stable maps from some uh, nodal rational curve C with marked points P J uh, to Y of class beta, such that each boundary marked point P J meets the interior of the divisor dj with tangency order mj and no other intersections with d. So exactly uh, the sort of moduli stack we consider in the Frobenius structure conjecture. And if we pick uh, an internal marked point pi, then we can evaluate at this internal marked point and we obtain something in U. And we can also take uh, the domain and take the stabilization of domain, we obtain a point in uh, the Deling bound for the stack of endpointed stable rational, uh, stable endpointed rational curves. So recall that the domain of a stable map may not be stable. Uh, thus, we need to take a further stabilization in order to get a stable curve. And we put them together, we have the natural map of phi i. It's very analogous to the map phi we considered in the proof of uh, the 
skeletal curve zero. And now uh, we have the theorem, source of skeletal curves, which says that phi i over the skeleton inside the target has finite fibers. And moreover, the fibers, they consist of skeletal curves, which just means that uh, uh, the pre-image of phi i by phi i of this skeleton inside the product uh, consists of skeletal curves. So that's the way we produce skeletal curves uh, in practice. And just a small uh, point, uh, here we consider closure of the skeleton. So it's a bit stronger than we just consider skeleton. And that is important uh, in the theory because we also want to consider degenerate domains. And in the proof of associate, associativity, for example, uh, it's, and also just in the classical theory of gromov witten invariants, uh, it's useful sometimes to degenerate uh, stable maps and to break them apart. So that's why we also consider the closure of skeleton, which will uh, contain these degenerate curves. So that's uh, the way we produce skeletal curves uh, in practice. And uh, the proof is the following. For finiteness, we again use the deformation theory. We can show that for any uh, fixed modulus of domain, the fiber of uh, phi i at mu is finite et al over some Zariski dense open subset of uh, the log color BR. And skeletalness follows from the skeletal curve theorem. So here, finiteness allows us to count curves naively without using virtual fundamental classes. And let me explain now, uh, how do we count them naively using this finiteness uh, result? So let me explain now naive counts of skeletal curves. The above theorem, source of skeletal curves, suggests a simple definition of naive counts associated to spines in the essential skeleton of U, which we explain now. And the study of properties of such counts is the main technical foundation of our theory. So recall, we have uh, our natural map phi i going from the moduli space of stable maps to the moduli space of stable curves by taking domain modulus and uh, to our log color b l by taking evaluation of some internal marked point. Now, uh, any stable map inside the pre-image by phi i of the skeleton in the target is skeletal uh, by the above theorem. So we have a canonically defined spine, which is just, uh, we take restriction of F to the uh, skeleton of our curve and this maps to the skeleton of U by the skeletal curve theorem. So here uh, we take the closure of the skeleton. It doesn't change much, just the more convenient to work with because otherwise it's just the infinite uh, curve thing like in Rn. If we take closure, it's just more convenient for notation. We can say where infinite uh, infinite point 
goes. So that's a very minor point. And conversely, given any abstract spine H from some graph, some tree uh, to the skeleton of U and some curve class beta, we want to count all skeletal curves uh, of class beta giving rise to this spine H. So this is our goal now. We want to define the count NH beta, uh, which is supposed to be the number of skeletal curves with span H and the curve class beta. So first question, uh, what is an abstract span in the essential skeleton of U? Mm, first, observe that uh, the essential skeleton of U has an intrinsic conical piecewise integral linear structure. The idea is the following. So if we take any SNC compactification of U, we obtain a simplicial cone complex structure on the essential skeleton. And now, two uh, such structures given by two different uh, SNC compactifications, they are just related by some uh, piecewise integral linear map. So therefore, uh, this essential skeleton has some intrinsic piecewise integral linear structure. And thus, it makes sense to define a spine in the essential skeleton to be a piecewise integral affine map H from some nodal metric tree to the essential skeleton. Mm, here is a picture. And so uh, now we consider such nodal metric tree gamma. This uh, is our essential skeleton and uh, we consider a span inside. And we denote by Vj the set of one valent vertices of gamma. Let us first consider the case of extended span. In other words, let's assume that all uh, the Vj's are infinite vertices. And we denote by Pj the weight vectors at every Vj. Uh, in other words, just the derivatives. So these purple vectors uh, are Pj. And we denote the whole, all the Pj, we put them as a tuple, bold P. So here we have five one valent vertices v1, v2, v3, v4, v5. And v5 uh, shoots up vertically, which means that the leg v5 is, map, uh, is mapped to a point. The map h can be constant on the whole leg. And in this case, this uh, p5 is zero, the derivative. So, Recall that uh, we said that uh, the essential skeleton of M0N is uh, homeomorphic to the modular space of uh, tropical curves, rational tropical curves with N legs. And in fact, this holds also after taking closure. So the closed essential skeleton of M0N is actually isomorphic homomorphic to uh, the moduli space of stable extended nodal rational tropical curves with n legs. Uh, thus, gamma, the hey. nodal... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I have a question on the this. So the, the trop bar is just a naive closure of the trop classification, right? A trop bar is a compactification 
of the moduli space of uh, tropical curves. Uh, so, so you Ah, so you allow internal legs of infinite lengths, yeah? For the... Uh, the legs, they, ah, uh, yes. I allow some edges to have infinite okay, lengths. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, because I don't know, like uh, the, I think the, the Jonathan Weiss and the Melody Chen, they have, they define the, the trap bar, like, uh, which is, yeah, I, I don't know. Is it, is it is coinciding with the Jonathan Weiss and the M Melody Chen's definition of the trap bar? So this uh, trap bar is here, zero n, I think it was uh, first uh, considered uh, in the paper by Abramovich, uh, Caparasso, and Payne. Okay. Called the uh, tropicalization of modulized space of um, stable curves, probably. And, uh, and uh, with Sean, we show that uh, here the essential skeleton is just uh, the essential is just the skeleton given by the classical Dunning man for the compactification. And then we apply uh, a result in the paper of uh, Abramovich, Caparoso, and Payne, which identifies the skeleton associated to the Dunning man for the compactification with this moduli space of extended tropical curves. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So they are really natural objects uh, when we consider compactification. Yeah, so we have our nodal metric tree and uh, it's just a point uh, in this moduli space of tropical curves. So by this homomorphism, we obtain a point in the skeleton of uh, M0N. And the recall, we have uh, our natural map phi i from the moduli space of analytic curves uh, to the moduli space of domain times uh, our local BL. And inside, we have a product of skeletons. And then we have a point gamma in the skeleton of the first factor. And we also have the point HVI. So in this picture, it's just uh, uh, this point, H of V5. We also have this point in the skeleton of U. So the pair together gives a point in the target. And now we just take uh, the pre-image by phi i of this point in the target. And by the skeletal curve theorem, the pre-image is just a finite uh, set and it consists of only skeletal curves. But uh, now we have a finite set and uh, not all curves inside this finite set uh, are good. So we further restrict to a subset Fi H beta consisting of stable maps whose spine is e equal to H. So this subset, uh, uh, this set Phi I inverse, it just says that uh, our curve has the correct domain and the internal marked point I, PI maps to the correct place. That's all. It doesn't say anything about the spine. That's why we consider a subset with the right spine. And then the count uh, NIH beta that we want, that was our goal, we want to define, we just let it be the length of this, uh, this subset considered as a zero dimensional analytic space because probably we have some neopotents or multiplicities. Uh, if we pass to a big enough infinite if we pass to a big enough uh, uh, algebraic closure, if we pass to uh, an algebraic closure, then it's enough to take um, just the cardinality of this set. So uh, we define the count 
NIH beta to be this length, uh, and NIH beta just means the number of skeletal curves associated to the spine H, curve class beta, and by evaluating at the ice marked point. So intuitively, this number uh, counts these purple rational curves, closed rational curves with the given spine, given red spine. And more generally, uh, we consider also non-extended spines. Sometimes we call it truncated spines. In other words, we allow some one valent vertices Vj to be finite. So the idea is to use toric tail condition to define the counts associated to truncated spines as in the first lecture. Uh, here is the picture. We have skeleton of our log color BL and we consider a truncated spine. So here the vertices V1, V3, V4 they are finite vertices, and the V2 and the V5, they remain infinite vertices. And in order, in order to count the skeletal curves associated to such spines, uh, we recall that we have a torus inside U with co-character lattice M, and this implies that the essential skeleton of U is equal to the essential skeleton of the torus and uh, is homeomorphic just to uh, M tensor with R, Rn. And now we can extend the truncated spine, this truncated spine H together with curve classes and we obtain an extended spine H hat and an extended curve class beta hat. So I wrote things regarding curve classes in blue just to mean that you can ignore it uh, if you are not familiar with the theory. They are uh, more auxiliary. So we can just focus on the spine. Mm. So we apply the constructions above. Uh, we apply the constructions above to this extended spine H hat and uh, extended curve class beta hat. We obtain a finite set Fi H hat beta hat as above consisting of closed curves with spine H hat. And now we consider subset a further subset satisfying the toric tail condition. We ask each punctured tail disk to lie inside our torus. So then uh, we are ready finally to define our count associated to such a truncated spine uh, to be simply the length of this uh, subset considered as a zero dimensional analytic space. So intuitively, this number just counts uh, this kind of open curves with given spine. And by open, we mean curves with boundaries. So that's the definition of our naive counts. And we have the following theorem uh, concerning this number, this counting number. Uh, so assume uh, the span H is in the general position. More precisely, we assume H is transverse to walls inside uh, the skeleton of U. So I will introduce uh, the notion of walls in the next lecture. Here, let's just imagine that H is in some general position, and then 
the count h i n i h beta, meaning the number of skeletal curves associated to the spine h and the curve class beta by evaluating at the ith marked point is independent of the choice of the internal marked point i and nor of the choice of the torus inside. Um, so remark, uh, the independence on I used to be called the symmetry theorem and had a tricky proof via deformation invariance. Now we have a much more conceptual proof via skeletal curves and uh, let me sketch below. So that uh, shows another application of uh, uh, skeletal curves. We can get a conceptual understanding of this independence of the choice of the marked point where we evaluate. So if there are any questions, you can ask, otherwise I will just uh, go to the proof of the symmetry theorem. Yeah, so let me explain the symmetry theorem by skeletal curves. Um, so the symmetry theorem is just the independence of uh, our count on the choice of the place, the point where we evaluate. I mean, if you think uh, why this is true, it's not really obvious because, uh, because we evaluate at an internal marked point I and we want to show that it doesn't depend on the choice of uh, this internal marked point. So maybe we want to move if we have two different places where we evaluate, maybe we want to move uh, from one place to another. But the trouble is that when we move from one place to one place to another, uh, at some point we will across some walls, and the spine is no longer transverse. So this kind of deformation invariance no longer uh, holds if we move across walls. In general, we will have some wall crossing formula if we go through, move across some walls. And here, uh, the way we want to show by a skeletal curves is that we can actually move through the walls if it is a skeletal curve. So let's, uh, let me give more details. So the idea is to move from one place to another uh, in the skeletal curve setting. And in that setting, we can go through the walls without some complicated wall crossing formula. Yeah, so let's recall uh, the setting from the proof of the skeletal curve zero. Um, we have a home scheme, uh, parametrizing maps from domain curve C to the target Y. And uh, we consider a subspace consisting of maps with a given intersection pattern uh, with the boundary and also some given class beta. And we also had uh, this uh, natural maps we have a universal curve, uh, two projections. Universal curve is just a product. And we have the natural map of phi. First factor is just a projection to C. Second factor is, a, is the universal map. And on Y, we have volume from omega and on H, by deformation theory, we produced a volume from omega H. 
for any point f in h, we denote uh, cf the fiber uh, of the universal curve at h, and uh, we denote the map, induce the map again by f, because that's what f means. So recall from the proof of the skeletal curve theorem, uh, f being skeletal is equivalent to f lies in the skeleton of h associated to the volume form. And uh, phi x lies in the skeleton of the target if and only if f lies in the skeleton of h and x lies in the skeleton of the fiber. So that is uh, what we have shown. The main point in the proof of the skeletal curve theorem. If you're confused about the rest, just... Uh, yeah. Yes. Now, it, now, you can formally write F license skeleton, F of curve license. Yeah. F uh, is a map. No, F is a map, but F is also a point of the space uh, uh, of H. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, uh, sure, sorry, you're right. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so F is also is a map, but it's also a point in the space of maps. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah so here we really showed that F as a map is a skeletal if and only if F as a point lies in the skeleton. So okay. that's what... Uh, oh. Okay, uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Says. Yeah. yeah, so now we assume F to be skeletal. In other words, we assume the point associated to the map is lies in the skeleton. So we have a canonically associated spine, uh, which is just given by restriction, H restricted to uh, the skeleton of the fiber, which is the same as skeleton of the curve. Uh, so it maps to the skeleton of U. So that's all what we have done in the proof of the skeletal curve theorem. And now let delta denote the graph of the spine H. And here uh, we make a claim. Assume that the spine H is in general position. In other words, assume it is transverse to walls. Then the skeleton of the fiber CF inside the pre-image by phi of delta is a connected component. So recall from this equivalence or recall from uh, just uh, from the fact that the whole skeleton of the curve lies in the skeleton of U, uh, the skeleton of this fiber uh, just uh, lies in the pre-image. And uh, we claim that this subset is a connected component. So I drew a picture for your understanding. Um, recall that our natural map phi goes from the universal curve C times H to C times Y. And we have the graph of the spine delta inside this target C times Y. And we have phi uh, going from C times H. So this is C times H. H is the base, the space of maps, and every fiber, uh, and this total space is product C times H. Every fiber is the curve C. So if we take pre-image by phi of uh, delta, uh, by the finiteness of phi, we obtain some graph inside uh, the product C times H. We obtain some graph. So this fiber, uh, the skeleton of this fiber CF, it lives 
inside the pre-image because this goes to uh, the skeleton as we have a skeletal curve, but we also have some other pieces. And the claim says that this fiber is actually a connected component. They do not, uh, it doesn't touch with other fibers. Um, so uh, it's not difficult to see that, uh, to show the claim. First, by the equivalence, uh, star, we see that this fiber, the skeleton of fiber is equal to the fiber of the pre-image uh, to the fiber of the pre-image over F. So this implies that uh, since it's a fiber and the fiber is always closed, so this implies that the inclusion is closed. And we are left to prove that the inclusion is open. And we uh, suppose the contrary, uh, we pick some, so suppose the contrary, we pick uh, a germ of a pass, like this green germ, starting from the fiber uh, the skelet this uh, skeleton of a fiber. We pick a germ of pass, zero epsilon, going to the pre-image by phi of delta, uh, starting from this fiber and then goes out. And uh, we can, so since uh, the image of by phi of this alpha lies in this product, uh, we can write it, write alpha as uh, two components, QT, FT. M maybe I should say that since, uh, so since we have shown that uh, the pre-image of uh, phi. So alpha uh, is a germ of pass in the pre-image uh, by phi. But we have shown that the pre-image of phi is just the product of uh, skeleton, skeleton of C and the skeleton of H. So we can write alpha as two components, QT, FT. QT is some point on the curve and FT is some uh, points in the modular space of maps. And we denote, since everything is skeletal here, we denote uh, by HT the spine of FT. And now observe that uh, the condition that alpha lies in the pre-image by phi of delta or phi alpha lies in delta and the delta being the graph of uh, H0, this just implies that HT of QT is equal to H0 of QT. So we have QT fixed, a fixed point on our curve, and it implies that for this small deformation of uh, our map H, uh, the image of this point doesn't move. And then, uh, by the continuity of tropicalization from FT to HT and the rigidity of transverse spines. Uh, this I will give more details in the next lecture. Uh, we deduce immediately that this equality must imply that HT is constant. In other words, there is no way to perturb uh, HT, no way to, to perturb the spine while keeping this uh, equality. So intuit intuitively, it's very simple. We have a, a spine and we have a fixed point QT and uh, we fix the image of that point. Then if this spine is transverse to walls, uh, the, we cannot move this spine. It's just fixed at that point. In other words, this HT 
is constant. And if HT is constant, it means that QTFT uh, lives in the pre-image of uh, this fixed point, Q0, H0, Q0, uh, for any T. And uh, that is a contradiction to the quasi-finiteness of the map phi. So I said that by deformation theory, uh, generically over the target, phi is uh, finite a tau. So in particular, it's quasi-finite. But here we just produced infinitely many, uh, we just produced a germ in the pre-image by phi of some point. And that's a contradiction. So uh, that completes the proof of the claim. Yeah, and the claim produces us uh, this nice connected component and uh, um, so let's just, uh, I just explained the proof of the claim, but let us recapitulate what is the statement of the claim. So we have uh, our natural map of phi from C times H to C times Y on, and uh, we have a skeletal curve. We have a skeletal curve F from C to Y on, and we assume that the associated spine is transverse. Then the claim says that uh, the skeleton of the fiber uh, CF inside the pre-image by phi of the graph of H is a connected component. And now observe the following. First, observe that the first factor of phi decides exactly where we evaluate for the second factor. The second factor of phi is a universal map. And the first factor of phi is the projection uh, to C. So the first factor determines where we are evaluating for the second uh, map. And furthermore, observe that if we take sum of degree of our map of phi restricted to this skeleton fiber. And here, the degree makes sense exactly by the claim, because we know that the map of phi is finite a tau, generically over the target. So the degree makes sense. But but if we restrict it to a subset, the degree may no longer make sense. And here it still makes sense because we restrict this finite a tau map to some connected component. And then the degree is still well defined because uh, the map remains to be finite a tau over some thickening of this uh, connected component, some neighborhood. So the degree makes sense, and we take the degree and we take sum of such degrees over all skeletal curves whose associated span is equal to H. And that is exactly the counts, the following count, NW, HW, beta, where we count uh, the number of skeletal curves associated to the spine HW, which is just uh, the spine H, but we add an internal marked point at W, meaning that we add some internal leg at W, which uh, is contracted, the leg. And then we consider the count of skeletal curves uh, associated to this augmented spine and the curve class beta by evaluating at the added marked point, W. And the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side by the definition of this count. So now we can conclude the symmetry theorem 
for transverse spine, the count, now we see that the count NIH beta is independent of the choice of the internal marked point. Because here we see that the left hand doesn't depend on the choice of W, and the right hand side is the count of uh, uh, skeletal curves uh, where we add where we evaluate at this point W, and W is allowed to move everywhere. So the count is invariant when we move W anywhere along the spine. And this shows the symmetry here. Uh, furthermore, we can show that adding or removing internal marked points uh, does not affect the counts at all. So this is an illustration of uh, uh, how we use skeletal curves uh, for ex ex establishing important properties of our counts. And we will see further examples of that uh, in later parts uh, of the lectures. Um, so here for the symmetry property, symmetry theorem actually we can have different proofs without passing through skeletal curves. Uh, but for other properties, we must use skeletal curves. And here it's nice to see that uh, using skeletal curves, we really have the freedom of moving the point W everywhere. Without using, without a, if the curve is not a skeletal, there's no way to cross a wall while keeping the invariance. Uh, as a proofs of the symmetry theorem, we don't move across the wall uh, if we don't use a skeletal curve. So uh, that's what I want to explain today. And uh, for the next uh, lecture, uh, I will talk about the deformation invariance uh, which is, um, and also many other properties of the counts that finally leads to the proof of uh, the associativity of the mirror algebra. And uh, for deformation invariance, as we said, usually it only holds outside the walls. When we cross a wall, we are supposed to have a wall crossing formula. We no longer expect the deformation invariance. But for skeletal curves, actually, there is some trickier deformation invariance uh, that somehow similar to this situation about uh, moving around this marked point across walls. For skeletal curves, uh, we can actually move across walls a little bit as long as uh, it's uh, sufficiently transverse, but not really transverse. For non-skeletal curves, it must be transverse uh, in order to have deformation invariance. But for skeletal curves, we can relax a little bit the transversality condition. And uh, that's actually important in the proof of uh, associativity uh, and also in the proof of uh, uh, in the proof of uh, uh, wall crossing formula, because uh, in associativity, I mean, the definition of uh, structure constants, if you remember from the last lecture, uh, the place we evaluate, we ask uh, the point to go to Q, and the Q is a Although it's a very generic point uh, at the level of analytic geometry, it's a very special point at the level of uh, tropical geometry. So all the spines that appear uh, in the definition of structure constants, as in the previous lecture, they are all very special. They are not transverse at all. So in order, 
And of course, we can make them transverse if we don't ask the marked point to go to Q, but to go to some place, to go to some point sufficiently close to Q. But then uh, we will have the choice of asking it to go to either the left of the wall or the right of the wall. Or if there are many more walls, then we have even many more choices of chambers. But in general, we have the choice of asking it to go to the left or go to the right. And it's not clear at all whether the structure constants uh, for the marked point going to the left is equal to the structure constants for the marked point going to the right. And this going from left to right across in the wall, we have to use the theory of skeletal curves again. So I will uh, explain more about that in, next, in the next lecture, uh, the next Monday. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe we have time, of, maybe, maybe I don't have time for the questions. Actually, I have a very simple question. You have this uh, variety H, yeah, which has yes. the same dimension as Y. It also has logarithmic volume form, yeah? Yes. Yeah, but is it, uh, yeah, so it means that you can start to reproduce from some log Calabio another log Calabio in a sense. By yes. This curve. Yes. Yeah. And this is, does this H contains a torus again, if you assume that Y contains a torus? Uh, this H. Yeah. H is a cover of the torus. Probably itself is not a torus. Ah, ah, it's, ah it could be more. Yeah. H is really the modular space, so. Yeah, yeah I see. Ah. And also, we don't really have a good complexification of H. Ah, so it's not local Calabio anymore. It's got the ramified cover, yeah. It's not clear whether it's log Calabio or not, because we only considered the, the essential skeleton of H associated to this particular volume form. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe there are other volume forms. Yeah, or maybe this volume form has zeros, yeah. It can have zeros or yes, no, yes. Okay, okay, so thank you and...